I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who conquers, I will eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This ends our reading. This morning, we are kicking off a brand new sermon series, and for the next five weeks, we will be diving into the book of Revelation. Now, some of you may be groaning inwardly or, <laughs> or outwardly if you're watching at home and nobody can hear you, <laughs> and that's fair enough. Because the book of Revelation contains a lot of disturbing imagery, fire, destruction, dragons, monsters, and a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. Revelation is a book that drips with blood and reeks of sulfur, and at the heart of this epic showdown between good and evil is a Jesus who seems more like an action hero than the -the turn-the-other-cheek figure that we know and love which might be great material for Netflix binge-watching, but why is it in the Holy Bible? Even Martin Luther had trouble with Revelation, saying once that Christ neither taught it nor knew it. Of course, later he realized he could use its powerful imagery against the Catholic Church and vice versa, but that's a whole other story. The book of Revelation has sparked debates for centuries. Some argued that it was written by a heretic. Others claimed that it was penned by a disciple. And to make things even more complicated, when the Nag Hammadi texts were found in Egypt in 1945, included were about 20 other books of Revelation that were far different from the New Testament Revelation. So who wrote the book, and why, and how? John was a Jewish prophet writing visions he claimed to have received while on the island of Patmos, which is about 70 miles from the city of Ephesus off the coast of Asia Minor in present-day Turkey. It's a mouthful, I know. He probably began to write sometime around 90 CE after fleeing from the war in Jerusalem, which tells us that this is wartime literature. We'll never know how or why, but somehow this wartime literature did make the cut into the New Testament, and after a ton of research, I believe the book still has something to offer Christians today especially when you consider the current state of the world, because Revelation was written for people struggling to balance their Christian faith with their social and economic survival. Sound familiar? So over the next few weeks, we are going to delve into this very difficult and challenging book to discover how Contrary to Luther's thinking, everything in this book does indeed point to Jesus Christ. And we shall begin by setting the stage with a bit of background. Revelation is a letter that was written to a community of believers in the early church sometime between 70 and 95 A.D., In those days, Christians were viewed as a bunch of woo-woo atheists and most kept quiet about their faith because coming coming out as a Christian would have meant being shunned and likely cost you all of your income. 
Proclaiming your Christian faith openly was like posting a controversial video online today and hoping that it doesn't go viral for all the wrong reasons. If you were outed as a Christian, you were fair game for persecution and social exclusion. So people often found themselves hiding and sometimes even compromising their Christian values just so they could continue to function in the world. And it was to these confused and oppressed Christians that our friend John from the island of Patmos wrote a letter that we know today as the book of Revelation. John writes this letter to the seven churches in Asia Minor as a letter of encouragement. A reminder that the living Christ is with them and that even though they are suffering now, Christ is indeed coming and will right all wrongs. Revelation is, believe it or not, a book of hope and, and, and encouragement to those who are living in the tension between God's kingdom and the Roman Empire and that is precisely why I find it to be such a compelling message for churches today. The Roman Empire was a vast collection of diverse peoples bound together by an efficient and ruthless government. The empire ruled with an iron fist, crushing everyone who opposed it. The emperor ruled absolutely. And citizens of the empire worshipped him as a god. He was the embodiment of the empire. No one dared cross him. He was the most powerful man on earth. Unlike those first Christians, we do not live under an absolute dictatorship. Although sometimes we might worry that we are heading in that direction nor are we oppressed because of our faith, since for all intents and purposes, it is the faith of the empire. Nevertheless, there are contained in John's letter timeless truths that are still fully applicable for us today as we too struggle to balance our faith life and our civic life. As we struggle with what it means to live as disciples of the crucified and risen Christ. And as we try and fail and try again to discern God's will for our community, our families, and for ourselves. The proper title of Revelation is also known as the Apocalypse of John. And while apocalypse sounds like a final showdown kind of word, it does not actually mean the end of the world. It means revealing of something hidden, hence the word revelation. The apocalypse of John is a revelation of our world as it is now and of how God is and always has been active in it. It's not some strange vision of tomorrow, it's a revelation of today, a truth about today. And it is a description of the kingdom of God and the promise of God's presence with us now. And while the imagery used by John could be perceived as a doomsday prediction, the intention was to offer hope and encouragement. John just had a really weird way of going about it. <laughs> Apocalypse also refer, refers to a genre of writing that was common in ancient times and would have been easily recognized by the intended audience. Similar to, say, the genre of romantic comedies today, where we know the boy will almost get the girl and then lose the girl and then win her back in the end, ancient readers would have immediately understood that apocalyptic writing involved wild, surreal descriptions that were not meant to be taken literally. The opening of the book of Revelation is an introduction to what John is trying to tell us. This is a message about Jesus Christ, he tells us, the crucified and risen one. 
and it is also a message from Jesus. Meaning Jesus is not just the main character of the writing, he is also the source of it as well. Decades after his resurrection, people struggled with what it meant to them that Jesus was alive and how his resurrection changed their lives. And in that sense, we are very much like them. In worship, in study groups, in our faith explorer group, we talk about this stuff all the time. We question it. We wrestle with it. How do we remain faithful when we feel Christ's absence a whole lot more than we feel his presence? So John is writing to all people everywhere who ache for the one who will deliver them from the injustices of the empire and the grinding economic inequality that keeps it running. He relates a vision of Jesus alive and present among them and listening to the cries of God's people. He reminds them that this is the Jesus who loves us the one who has already freed us from our sins and who has consecrated us as priests to proclaim his gospel to the world. So the passage is full of promise, but before you know it, the promise suddenly becomes a warning. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, John is instructed to write praises for keeping a pure faith and continuing to endure But then the tone quickly changes to admonishment for their failing to do so with love, while also emphasizing that love is more important than saying, believing, or doing the right things. Jesus, through John, then goes on to send similar messages to each of the other six churches, praising their victories and warning them of their mistakes. So, In a nutshell, the message to a struggling body of believers is this. Jesus is with you and Jesus is watching you. It is an oddly worded message written about Jesus, dictated by Jesus, and penned by some guy named John. And over the next five weeks, it's going to get a whole lot odder. I promise. (laughs) But somewhere... In all of that, I believe that we will find more than enough wisdom to speak to some of our challenges today. Because like the faithful who have gone before us, we still find ourselves at the mercy of forces that are beyond our control. We still fear and mistrust our elected officials. We watch with dismay the uncertainty of our economy and the cost of meeting basic needs. We are surrounded by the zeal of religious extremists, and we worry incessantly over the decline of our beloved church. We live seemingly safe and sheltered lives, yet we are reminded daily that we are both at the mercy of the empire and willing participants of it too. And maybe that's the biggest rub of all. Yet over the eons, John's message rings as loud and clear today as it did to those ancient churches in Asia. God is the almighty ruler of heaven and earth, more powerful than the government, more stable than the stock market. And Jesus Christ is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and ending of our faith, the first and last word. He is the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is coming. We may feel his absence painfully now, but just as surely as he is the firstborn of the dead, he is coming here to be with us, and no force on earth can withhold him from us, for he is the Almighty. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches, and may it be with you all according to God's word. Amen. And now let us rise as we're able and join together in singing Community of Christ.
Please be seated. And now let us enter into our time of prayer together. We have no requests from Fletcher this morning, but please know that we are keeping you all in our prayers. Do we have any prayer requests this morning in the sanctuary? Carolyn. I just want to give a shout out of thanksgiving to Sam and Cameron, our media guys. They're awesome. They are awesome. Yes, absolutely. And you can clap if you want. <laughs> Yes, Clarice. I'm just pleased to see someone in church. I uh, Lucy Becker was over there. Yes. And what a blessing. And um, really, she had a miracle there. So we're just yes. thankful to see her here. Today. Prayers of praise and celebration. <laughs> Yes, we lift up Larry, who is facing a medical procedure. Yes, Sam. Yes, we're grateful that you got back safe and sound. <laughs> yes, Sue. Barbara and Larry, Mary Lou, Matt, and Ben. We are still keeping you in our prayers now and always. Yes. Prayers for Gaza. Absolutely. Did I see a hand over here? Oh, right here. Yes. A prayer for my daughter Luann, who is flying home to Maryland to be with the family for family funeral. Okay. Prayers for Luann, who will be flying to Maryland to be with the family for a funeral. Yes, Ron. Prayers for the people in Sudan who we don't hear about nearly as much, but who are going through equally awful, horrific situations. We lift them up. Yes, Margaret. Continued prayers for Wayne and for Vanessa. Terry. Um, Mark is up in Maryland right now and uh, visiting with sons and grandsons, but he is going to meet with Morgan, my granddaughter Morgan, tomorrow, and they're going to probably purchase a vehicle. So prayers for this brand new driver. It's going to be on the road. <laughs> prayers for a brand new driver named Morgan. <laughs> Let us pray silently. God most high, God with us, we praise you with every word we speak and with every moment we fall silent. You hear our prayer and sustain us along with all living things. You forgive our sins and bring us close to live in the goodness of your holy presence. We pray for your awesome deeds of salvation for us and to all the farthest edges of the earth. With the strength that raised mountains, calm the roaring seas of conflict, calm the waves of violence and oppression, draw all nations and peoples close to each other. 
We pray to you this morning for everyone who longs for your joy, for those who are sick or in pain from morning to night, for those whose grief weighs them down, for those who hunger and thirst for guidance, righteousness, or food. Rain down your love once again, O oh God. Soften our hearts so our lives can bear your fruit. Crown our lives with your goodness and let everything we do overflow with blessings for your people. Hear our prayers in the name of the one who brings us joy, Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Mother, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is the place in our service where we offer to give some of our worldly goods to the church in support of God's work in the world. Many of us give online. Some of us prefer to give during the service in person. To that end, there is an offering plate at each of the two doors, entrance doors, and also here on the table. For those of you is joining us virtually, you are invited to take part in the ministry and mission of this church by giving online. Simply go to the church website at pleasanthilluccn.org where there is a tab for giving. Freely you have received, freely give. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive.
May we bow our heads in prayer. We dedicate this offering, Lord, for the work of the church and ask you to use all that we have and are in your service. Amen. As we partake of this bread and fruit, we honor creator and creation. As we bless and share these gifts, we celebrate the table fellowship of Jesus. As we receive the fruits of the spirit, we celebrate the communion of all things. Creator, Christ, and spirit dance as one. All are worthy, all are welcome, so may it always be. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. O oh God, our mother and father, bread baker and wine maker, we give you thanks and praise. You worked the world into being instilled all creation with life, and shaped us as your people. In Jesus Christ, the bread of life and the true vine, you feed us with the word and nourish us from the stalk. <clears throat> o present spirit, help us realize and recognize the risen Christ in the baking of the bread. Feed the world with this bread. Bring it joy with this wine. Give it leaven and salt in us, a community of faith strengthened by your meal. Amen. We remember that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus shared his last meal with his friends. He took the bread, he broke it, he gave thanks. And he passed it among them, saying, This is my body shared for you. <clears throat> In the same manner, he took the cup after supper. And as he poured, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant poured in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it and remember me. And so we take, we eat, we drink, and we remember there is no greater love than the love of Jesus for us. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Come, for all things have been made ready. And we will follow our usual rotation. <clears throat>
Please join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. Remain with us, O oh God. Make this feast the nourishment we need to grow more wild and wonderful. Graft us onto the vine of your beloved so that we might grow more connected with you and all of creation. With this food and this drink, let us be the love that we have found in you and your beloved. Amen. And now let us join together in our closing hymn, Rejoice, Give Thanks, and Sing. And please rise as you are able. Please be seated. Will you please join me in our closing prayer? O oh Lord, may I so live that those who know me and know not thee may want to know thee because they know me. Amen. May our tears bless the ground on which we walk. May our breath sustain our bodies, which house our souls. May our beating hearts remind us of your love for all. Through our hearts, our breathing, and our tears, let us care for your children in this holy wilderness. Amen.
We are so glad you could join us this morning at Pleasant Hill Community Church. We'd like to invite you to join us in person if you are in the area. Join us for our meet and greet time at 945 before the service to talk with members and friends and then worship with us at 1030 each Sunday morning. All of God's people are welcome to our service. No matter where you are at in your life's journey, you are welcome here. To find out who we are, please go to our website at pleasanthillucctn.org or see us on our Facebook page. Until next week, thank you for worshiping with us this morning.